Can Jesus rise from the dead? Yes, they actually were trying to figure out what he meant by that statement, but that's only because they thought no one can rise from the dead, so surely Jesus can't mean that literally. He did mean it literally. Ye must be born again, again. Ye must be born again, again. I verily, verily say unto thee, Ye must be born again, again. Good morning and welcome to the Bible Study Pal podcast. My name is Greg Circle, the preacher for the Church of Christ that meets in Palmyra, Indiana. On today's episode of the podcast, we continue our study of the gospel according to Mark, the book of the month for January 2023. We continue in chapter 9 today, going from verses 9 through 37. If any thoughts or questions arise during this study, join in the conversation by putting them in the comments below. Ye must be born again, again. Let's get into the study. Mark chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. Can he rise from the dead? Now remember, just before this, we had the account of Peter, James, and John going with Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus was transfigured, metamorphosized before them. His clothes became indescribably white. He appeared with Elijah and Moses talking to him. And as Peter and James and John were coming down the mountain slope with Jesus, he told them not to reveal to anyone what they had seen until after the Son of Man rose from the dead. And here again, we see Jesus telling them not to tell anyone. This secrecy can be a little unnerving for some, but there are reasons for it, which we've talked about in previous episodes. But that's not the point. Notice how the central triumvirate responded. What did he mean by rise from the dead? Hindsight being 2020, or better, we can say he meant rise from the dead. But Jesus spoke to them in parables. Yes, he explained the parables to his disciples but they had to ask. They had to ask him. They don't immediately do that. They first discussed the possible meanings among themselves. Then it seems they discussed how to bring it up to Jesus indirectly. I wonder if they thought, maybe he means literally rise from the dead. That's got to be a tough thing for him to think about. If he's going to rise from the dead, that means he's got to die, and that's something we really don't want to think about. Let's ask him in a roundabout way. Possibly because of their experience a few moments ago, they draw on what they had been taught and ask, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? I wonder if they were thinking, maybe Jesus will be the host for the spirit of Elijah? Jesus responds saying that the scribes are partially correct. Elijah does come first and restore all things. He also pointed out that they were missing something. If all things are restored, why will the Son of Man suffer contempt? The scribes were not putting all of the pieces together. They were looking for Elijah, as per Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, but they also needed to look for one like a son of man who would go to the Ancient of Days, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. John's life parallels Elijah's in one fascinating way. Elijah's life was pursued by an evil queen, Jezebel, who was at the side of a weak king, Ahab. So was John the Baptist's life. An evil queen, Herodias, sought his life from the side of a weak king, Herod. The difference is Herodias succeeded where Jezebel failed. They did to Elijah the Second, i.e. John the Baptizer, whatever they wished. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 23. If you can... We come to another of Jesus' exorcisms. Mark gives us the background of this event. The scribes are arguing with the rest of the apostles because they could not cast this demon out of the boy. Why not? Unbelief. Who's unbelief? I want you to first notice the father's words, where he says, I told your disciples to cast it out. He ordered them to do it. He must have heard about their authority over the unclean spirits that Jesus gave them in chapter 6 and verse 7. This man believed that the disciples could do it. Imagine his shock when they could do it for others, but not his son. Was their authority gone? Where did it go? Where did it come from to begin with? This man continues with his imperatives even toward Jesus. Help us, having taken pity on us. 
I say it that way because that's the order in which Mark writes it. And also the fact that help is the actual imperative and taking pity is a participle that modifies the imperative. And as it modifies that imperative, it draws on that imperative idea. Jesus had to take pity on this boy and his father if he's going to help. But one thing about imperatives that we need to keep in mind is that when an inferior is speaking to a superior, as this man is speaking to Jesus and as we speak to God, imperatives become strong requests. And as such, our imperative spoken toward God should always be accompanied with the thought, yet not my will, but your will be done. Was this the idea of the man saying, if you are able? Was he saying, if it be your will? I don't think so, because Jesus repeats the man's conditional statement, and that seems to state that Jesus recognized the boy's father was starting to doubt. But Jesus reassures him, all things are possible to him who believes. Mark chapter 9, verses 24 through 29. Help my unbelief. The imperatives continue. Help my unbelief. This man had a faith, but it wasn't a mature faith. He could say, as the apostles would another time, increase our faith, Luke 17, verse 5. It was a seed of faith, though. He could have gone away discouraged after the disciples had failed. Perhaps each tried. Perhaps each tried multiple times. Failure after failure, and this man was still pleading for their help. But they couldn't. If their authority was gone, maybe Jesus' authority was too. But the Father didn't give up. He went to the source. There was a weed of doubt, or a stone lay underneath the thin layer of soil that covered his seed of faith, and the sun was rising. He needed to have that stone moved so that his roots would not be parched looking for moisture in the sun-baked soil. We pray for faith, but it takes faith to pray. Augustine said, where faith fails, prayer perishes. If you don't believe, why pray? Prayer is gone. But this man still had a little bit of faith left in him. He asks Jesus. He requests Jesus. He gives an imperative to Jesus. Help. And Jesus responded accordingly. He commanded the unclean spirit to come out. The spirit perhaps killed the boy. And Jesus raised him, either from his weakness or from death itself, by taking his hand. So it wasn't the unbelief of the father that was the problem. He prayed. He let his request be made known to the Son of God, therefore to God himself. The problem was with the disciples. In Luke's account, we read that Jesus made a point to them that they needed to take to heart. They said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name, Luke 10, verse 17. Jesus made sure to emphasize that last prepositional phrase when he said, Do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. They didn't remember, in this case, where their authority and ability lay. They didn't pray. Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Can he really? Now remember this episode started with the apostles questioning, can Jesus rise from the dead? Yes, they actually were trying to figure out what he meant by that statement, but that's only because they thought no one can rise from the dead, so surely Jesus can't mean that literally. He did mean it literally. And don't call me Shirley. Can he really rise from the dead? Can he really cast out a demon? Jesus then takes the apostles through Galilee to tell them again about what's going to happen. Go back and look at chapter 8, verse 31. But they still didn't understand what he was saying. And note this, again, they were afraid to ask him. So instead of directly asking for clarification as they had done in the past, they decided to assume that Jesus would rise from the dead as some, most notably Herod Antipas, thought that John the baptizer had. Go back to chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. Those such as Herod thought that Jesus was simply carrying on John's work. Did the apostles think this? Peter recognized that Jesus was different. We tend to think that the other apostles believed the same way. Even if they did, Peter would later show a continued misunderstanding of Jesus' destination. He'll still draw his sword and fight for Jesus to not be captured, but to set up an earthly kingdom. 
So which one would it be? Which one is the greatest of Jesus' disciples, as Jesus was of John, as they maybe saw him? Which one would take the mantle of the Son of Man, as Elisha took the mantle of Elijah? Keep in mind, though, that John said Jesus was superior to him. John wasn't even worthy to untie Jesus' sandals. Jesus was, in John's mind, the king, not one of his disciples. If anything, John would be a disciple of Jesus. He was Jesus' servant. But Jesus tells his disciples they needed to be last of all and servant of all, which is what he would do. He would suffer when he need not suffer, being undeserving of such suffering. He would give his life as a ransom for many, and he would rise three days later. Could he really? Yes. Yes, he could. Yes, he would. Ye must be born again, again. Ye must be born again, again. I verily, verily say unto thee, We invite you to join us as we worship our Lord and study His Word each Sunday morning at 9.15 a.m. for Bible classes for all ages, 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. for two distinct worship services, and each Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. for another chance to study and discuss God's Word. Occasionally, we may alter the p.m. service times for a special event. Please check palmyrachurchofchrist.org or our Facebook page for the schedule for the week. If you have any questions or would like to have a Bible study in person or by correspondence, email preacher at palmyrachurchofchrist.org or call 812-364-6215. Thank you for listening.